Power, Heat and Geometry, a video drawn from the book Computation and Its Limits. I've given quite a few videos based on other books I've written, How the World Works, Economic Planning in an Age of Climate Change, In Defense of Materialism. This one is based on another book, Computation and Its Limits, which is a materialist polemic against idealist interpretations of computer science. And this video draws on the first part of chapter five. Now, why did digital computing win out? Because prior to that, there was a long history of analog computing. Um, this active tradition of analog computing continued right until the 1960s and was only gradually replaced by digital techniques. And indeed the tradition of analog gun control computing, which I've sometimes lectured on, um, continued beyond the 1940s and was used in the first Gulf War. Through the 1950s and 60s, these electronic analog computers were serious rivals of digital ones for many tasks. Uh, the analog approach ultimately lost out because of two problems, accuracy and programmability. They were hard to program. An analog computer like this had to be programmed by rewiring it, essentially. You set up a new electronic circuit using plug boards and you connected up addition and multiplication units to get a new formula. And you program the constants into the formula using dials. You turn them to the constant you wanted. And these dials operated variable resistors. Now, if you're using a potentiometer as your input of numbers, you had at best two digits of accuracy if it was a really good potentiometer. And if your multiplication was going to be done using valve amplifiers, again, you'd be lucky if your accuracy was within 1%. Once you'd fed it through several stages of computation, you might get errors as high as 10%. Primarily because analog voltages were all subject to noise. Now, digital computers also use analog voltages. So how do they escape from this? You have a voltage raise it running from 0 to 3.3 volts, for example, in most CPUs. And these two must be subject to noise. So how does the digital system avoid the noise that killed analog computation? Well, it does it by thresholding. It treats any voltage above a given threshold as a one. And so long as the noise doesn't push things above or below that threshold, you're OK. So if the orange signal is what you want to transmit, OK, and you've got some circuit noise represented by the yellow signal, add the two together you get this wavy digital signal. And if you put a, a scope onto one of the terminals of a computer, you do see wavy signals. You don't see perfect square waves. You see this sort of thing. But it's fine, provided you don't cross the threshold. Provided you're above the threshold when it's one and below the threshold when it's a zero. If that happens, the original signal is perfectly reconstructed. But then you have to ask, are voltages really analog? We're used to thinking of them as a continuous analog quantity. But we also know that electrons exist and electrons are discrete. And this implies that if you're considering things on a small scale, the voltage on a very small capacitor must rise in discrete steps as the number of electrons on it change. Now, you might not think that's important, but ICs 
get small enough that this becomes an effect. Uh, here's a close-up of a, a CMOS camera chip and these have lots of little capacitors which can be addressed and they have on top of them red, green and blue filters so that you can take a, a colour photo but obviously the silicon isn't red, green and blue. And these capacitors release electrons when photons hit them. Now, because photons are discrete and because one photon hitting it will release one electron, it means you can actually see the electrons. If you take a good quality phone camera and take a photo of the sunset like this, where you're in the margin between there being enough light to operate the sensor and there being darkness. Each time a photon hits a capacitor, it releases electrons and the analog to digital converter then reads the charge off. But because at the very low level you're dealing with discrete numbers of photons and because this is a quantum process and therefore random, at low light intensities you can actually see shot noise. I've blown up an area of the picture here and if you look you can see the speckle and that's the shot noise caused by variations in the number of discrete electrons hitting it. Now since this is a, a JPEG image it's complicated by the fact that the shot noise is trying to be rendered by a discrete cosine transform but the, the reason why it's not all smooth is due to shot noise. Now, what does this imply for logic circuits? It means you mustn't allow the random fluctuations due to the physical existence of electrons to exceed the threshold of your logic chips. And provided you've got big objects, that's fine, big circuit components. That's fine. But here's an example here where the shot noise is much higher than the previous example. And in one place, it actually passes the threshold and will be read the wrong way. Now, the arrival of the electrons, as I say, is subject to shot noise. It'll follow a Poisson distribution with a standard deviation that varies as the square root of n, where n is the mean number of electrons used to represent a 1. And it's clear that by raising n, the number of electrons, you can improve the signal to noise ratio, which is going to be um, root n upon n. So every time you increase the size of the capacitor or area of a capacitor by 2 you'll improve the signal to noise ratio by root 2. So large components have good signal to noise ratio. Suppose we are using a device that measures in the range 0 to 1 volt and that we treat anything above 0.6 of a volt as true. And suppose that the mean number of electrons we use is 100. Now signal will be root square root of 110 so how likely is it that we will only get 60 quanta 60 electrons so that the voltage fails to falls to 0.6 of a volt or below given the shot shot noise well that is to say how likely is it you get a deviation of six standard of four standard deviations from the mean Using tables, you can look this up, and the probability is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, And that sounds very small, but if you had a computer with a million gates, 31 of these would give an indeterminate result each clock cycle, which is obviously completely unacceptable. It might be acceptable for some forms of transmission of data over long distances, 
but it's not acceptable within a digital circuit. Now let's let's take a a modern chip. A million gates is way way too small. For instance, Apple's M2 Ultra has 134 billion gates, and it runs not at a megahertz. It runs at 35 gigahertz. When you work it out, you find that you need a separation between the voltage for one and the threshold, whatever the threshold was, of 11 sigma to be reliable here. Uh, if we keep the, the previous assumption that it's 0.4 of the, the digital one voltage, the threshold, you would need around 700, 770 electrons for reliable operation or more than 770 electrons for a reliable operation. And you can work out what the gate capacitance would be for that um, at 3.3 volts, which is a standard voltage for most PCs. It's quite possible, most CPUs, it's quite possible that Apple are using a smaller voltage in the M2 chip, which I'll get onto later. And if for a square capacitor that would give an edge of 17 nanometers and if we would look I'll tell you later how to work that out if you take a cross section of the M2 chip you can see from this little indicator here which says 20 20 nanometers that we're well above that the M2 is com comfortably above that so it, it you it will work reliably and I'm making very pessimistic assumptions here, incidentally. How do you work out the area? Well, this is the formula for working out the area. Uh, it's the important thing. It's proportional to the dielectric constant of the insulator, K. And it's proportional to the area of the capacitor and inversely proportional to the separation of the plates. For Silicon dioxide, the dielectric constant is around just around four, but due to the problem of leakage currents, newer chips use hafnium oxide of all things, which has a dielectric constant of 20, five times greater. That obviously means that the capacitance of a capacitor of the same area using hafnium oxide is going to be five times greater. Now let's apply this to an older chip, the one that it's applied to in the book, because the book came out in 2010 and it, it, it relates to what were then the latest available chips. At that point, the, the best chip I could take as an example was the AMD K10, which had been announced in 2008. And that had 500 million gates. It seemed a lot at the time, but it's small by modern standards. And it was built on a 65 nanometer process. The oxide thickness was 1.2 nanometers and it was using silicon dioxide. So you can work out the gate dimensions, you can work out the number of square meters it is, the distance between plates, and that gives you the capacitance of a gate. And the power per gate is going to be the product of the frequency the square of the voltage and the capacitance. This is assuming the gate is switching every clock cycle. If it was switching at 2 gigahertz, which would be a reasonable speed for such a chip of that period, you would be dissipating 2.6 microwatts per gate. Each gate would be 2.6 microwatts. Now a microwatt seems a very small amount of energy, but you scale it up by the number of gates, 500 million gates. And let's assume that only 10% of the gates switch each cycle. How did I arrive at that? I thought, well, if you take into account that you only dissipate energy when you discharge from a 1 to a 0, half the time things are zero, half the time they're one at a ra in a random logic circuit. So that already cuts it in half. If something starts out as a one, only half the time 
will it go to a zero, assuming zeros and ones occur with equal frequency. So that already cuts it to a quarter. And then I thought, well, let's assume that if you've got a 64-bit machine and you're carrying out arithmetic, most of the time the upper bits of each word won't change. They'll just be zeros. So let's, let's reduce it by a further factor. And I came to the conclusion that let's say, assume 10% of gates actually discharge energy each clock cycle. Now, when you feed the actual clock speed in, you find that this predicts that a K10 should dissipate 130 watts, just based on the most elementary electrostatic calculations. And it's a very simplified model, but despite that, the estimated power consumption is almost sp spot on because the AMD said that the machine dissipated between 65 and 140 watts uh, on clock speeds between 1.8 gigahertz and 2.6 gigahertz. So that seems to give you a pretty reasonable estimate of it. We may have somewhat overestimated, underestimated the size of the gates on the K10. I was still going on what I'd learned in my VLSI classes, which allowed you to assume that the area of a gate was going to be roughly the same as the lambda or the smallest feature size of a technique. Um, if that's not the case, the gates would actually have been larger. Apparently on modern uh, seven nanometer processes, they are larger than seven nanometers. So that may have been true even at 65 nanometers. Um, so if we allow for that, perhaps it was only 2%. I don't know. Um, let's apply it to the Apple M2, which is a very modern chip. This has a smaller power draw than the K10, which came out ooh, 12 years earlier, well, 14 years earlier. And it has a faster clock speed three and a half gigahertz instead of a max of 2.6 gigahertz. It has 260 times as many gates. Obviously the gates are smaller. Now from, it's very difficult to get information about what size of gates Apple actually uses. Reading stuff about the Taiwan Semiconductor Company's um, seven nanometer process, I reckon that the gates are probably around 4.8 times 10 to the minus 16 square meters. But they're using hafnium oxide, so the capacitance per unit area is greater. Um, if you feed the same formulas through as worked for the K10 back in 2010, you find that the machine should be using much, much more than 25 watts. Way above that. Should be dissipating above a kilowatt. This means that things have happened since then to make power efficiency much better. Possible things which add to that is, well, if you work it out, only 0.1% of the gates must be switching each clock cycle if you're dissipating only 25 watts. Well, why might that be? A lot more of the area is used for cache. And cache chips don't change most, most clock cycles. Most of it isn't red. Another thing is that this is a RISC chip and RISC op opcodes require less logic to decode them. And I think Apple must be taking a lot more care in inactivating portions of the logic that are not used in a given instruction in order to prevent power waste. 
exactly how these things are done, I don't know. It's also possible that they've substantially reduced the internal working voltage. If they were able to reduce it to one volt, they'd reduce power consumption by an order of magnitude. Back in the 90s, processor speeds were growing rapidly. If they'd continued on the trend shown here from, the, from 1990 to the early 2000s, we would be operating now with machines around 1,000 gigahertz. We'd have PCs operating at 1,000 gigahertz, which is 100 times faster than the machines we currently have. So there's clearly something happened a bit after 2000 because there's scarcely any improvement in frequency after that. We had a period of very rapid improvement from the late 80s to the early 2000s and then it leveled off and if anything got worse slightly in recent years. So why is that? Using the sort of capacitance arguments I've just presented in this video, when I gave my lectures on the limits to computing in the early 90s, I worked out or predicted that processor speeds were going to peak between 1 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz. I used two independent methods to arrive at the heat dissipation for that. The reason is that above that frequency, the power dissipated per square centimetre becomes too great even for liquid cooling to handle. And that's exactly what happened. And you, can deri you could derive that from very, very simple physics. You could predict knowing the dielectric constant of silicon dioxide, what the boundary was going to be. And knowing what the maximum heat dissipation you could get with liquid cooling. The only type of cooling that was available around 1990 that was better than that was for radar chips where they dissipated a lot more heat than that, but they pumped water into narrow grooves in the chips and allowed the water to turn to steam. That's obviously not something you want in a home computer. Where room remained for improving performance was from data parallelism. Classical imperative and functional programming wouldn't be able to harness this, that was clear. Only programming based on ideas like those of Iverson whose data parallel model held any hope for in the long run. Um, if you're not familiar with Iverson, I've mentioned him several times in other videos. His famous book was A Programming Language, which came out in 1972. And it's an absolute classic of computer science. If you can get hold of a copy and read it and you're a computer scientist, I strongly advise you to because it is a treasure trove of clever ideas and it laid the conceptual basis for all subsequent development of data parallel languages and data parallel computers. Data parallel languages obviously are now represented by things like MATLAB. Uh, I concluded at the end of the 90s that there was no further point in doing research into object-oriented languages. I didn't think you'd get performance out of those. And that the key problem for compilers was how to get efficient implementation of Iverson type constructs in the emerging parallel machines which existed. Uh, I've got a couple of other books on this topic and I could give talks on this if people are interested. Iverson's original system was all interpretive. It wasn't concerned with speed. It was concerned with um, ease of expression. 
of data parallel problems. And that's the key advantages of his conceptual notation. But as I say, if people are interested in this topic and say so in the comments, I can give further talks on it.